Hi, Levy. Hello. Hi, welcome to Meaning of Life.tv. I'm uh, glad you can join us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So let me introduce us. Uh, I'm Philip Menchaca of Meaning of Life and BloggingHeads.tv. Um, and you are Levy McLaughlin, a professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at North Carolina State University. And we're here today to talk about religion and uh, politics in Japan. That's right. And you seem like a good person to talk to about this. <laughs> it's your field of expertise, uh, and particularly Soka Gakkai, uh, right. which is Japan's uh, largest, I guess you can call it new religion, new mm -hmm. religious movement. Yes. Um, and it's actually, it's international. Um, and you've spent uh, years doing, I think, field work. Um, it's called participant observation research, where you uh, not, not, not join, but, you know, uh, observe the group um, on the ground. That's right. Um, and I, I should say, Soka Gakka is not just in Japan, but it's, uh, it's an international organization. That's um, correct. Soka Gakka is arguably Japan's most successful religious export. And that's saying a lot, if you think about, you know, Zen and things like that. Right. In terms of sheer numbers of adherents, uh, they, they claim members in 192 countries and territories across the world, possibly two, two million members outside Japan, and um, the claims in Japan are 8.27 million households, the official number, which, which is exaggerated, but something like 3% of Japan are active participants in Soko Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Well, at least in the West, I don't think it's, it's not talked about much. Um, which is funny because it is this enormous uh, religious movement. Right. Um, and so I wonder if you could just give us a, a quick description of what, uh, what they believe. Um, sure. Or of the group generally. Yeah. The group is a bit of a paradox. Um, technically, uh, the largest uh, so-called new religion in Japan, new religion is a very contentious term, but it basically means uh, any religious organization founded in the last 200 years or so. Um, the, they didn't even begin as a religion, as the name of the group may indicate. Soka Gakkai can be translated literally as Value Creation Study Association, and that uh, indicates its roots as a, an educational reform movement. It was founded by a bunch of school teachers. Uh, in, in and around the 1930s, uh, people who were interested in particularly uh, reforming uh, elementary school education. The two primary founders of the group uh, converted to a form of lay Buddhism following the teachings of a medieval reformer named Nichiren. And this uh, made them uh, basically adherents of a very particularistic type of religious practice, which uh, focused on the primacy of a specific teaching in Buddhism called the Lotus Sutra, the putative final teachings of the historical Buddha, and all other teachings were considered to be false and to be done away with. And so complete was their dedication to this exclusive focus on the Lotus that these founders, whose names were Makiguchi Tsunisaburo and Toda Jose, uh, were willing to be imprisoned by the wartime Japanese authorities in defense of their religious principles. And so there were some of the very few people in Japan who actually resisted wartime authoritarian uh, government. And Makiguchi dies in prison. Toda is released from uh, prison right before the end of World War II and goes on to basically uh, construct the most massive uh, religious organization in post-war history. Yeah, and and we'll, we'll get more into sort of the political side of mm -hmm. things in, in contemporary Japan right now, but I think, uh, you know, even, well, well, you tell me, even at the beginning when it was being formed, how much was it a uh, sort of religious movement and how much was it uh, more of a political reaction to this time of, of great upheaval in Japan? Um, one of the things to keep in mind for why Soka Gakkai grew so large is it's, it, that these, these two trends are intertwined. So Soka Gakkai distinguished itself by entering into electoral politics pretty early. Uh, it started running independent candidates for office from 1955, and in 1964 founded a political party called Kolmeto, or the Clean Government Party. Um, 
And Cometo has been accused by its religious and political detractors as being uh, in violation of Japan's post-war constitution. The constitution guarantees a division of religion and government. Um, the defenders of Cometo point out that the constitution also uh, protects freedom of association, freedom of expression, and other things that would allow any group to, to enter into political, out, in political life. But Soka Gakkai entered into politics because of Nichiren Buddhist uh, mandates. Back up a little bit on here. So Nichiren was a, was a medieval founder who uh, lived in the 13th century, in the 1200s in Japan. And he, was, he distinguished himself as being absolutist, as I mentioned earlier, focusing entirely on the Lotus Sutra. Followers of Nichiren have also sought to basically realize his posthumous desires, his aims, by uh, celebrating the conversion of the Japanese populace by constructing a specific type of temple facility, which is called in modern language the Kokuritsu Kaidan, or the National Ordination Platform. And so in order to construct this, first you have to convert, convert the majority of the populace to Soka Gakkai, or to Nichiren's Buddhism. Soka Gakkai thinks this means converting to Soka Gakkai. And then to get the national government to support the construction of this massive facility. So Soka Gakkai started fielding candidates express, expressly because they wanted to construct this. But that's not where the story ends. So what happens when you, when you enter politics and when you become successful in terms of a lasting presence in electoral politics is that you become part of the machine. You become part of the, the existing structures. And so Cometo may have begun as a religious project. But today, if you look at its policies and you look at its politicians, it is what I and my colleagues argue is a normal party in the sense of formulating policies that appeal to voters, um, finding a place for itself as a minority party within, uh, you know, strategically finding a place for itself as it is now in the, the ruling coalition. So it, it is now the, the junior partner in Japan's national diet ruling government. So it, it cooperates with the LDP or the Liberal Democratic Party and uh, has been cooperating with the LDP since 1999. Um, so, so far, there's no evidence that this is, there's been uh, an attempt on the part of Colmeto to carry out this religious uh, project. In fact, it expressly uh, abandoned it in 1970. And so far, that seems to be pretty much the case. Okay. And this is, intriguingly, this has led to conflicts between members of Soka Gakkai who now see Colmeto as, as growing distant from its founding principles. Yeah. So what we have is, so we have this... Religious organization and uh, with a goal to an explicit goal to spread Nichiren Buddhism um, That's right. throughout Japan. That's and, right. And a expression of that is the construction of this uh, this this shrine that they're trying to. Um, that was that was a motivating goal. Mm -hmm. Now. Um, there were a series of scandals and upsets in the 1960s that led Soka Gakka and Komeito to officially split. And by 1970, they were separate organizations. And since then, we haven't seen them attempt to create any kind of equivalent of that national ordination platform. Um, so there are a few other things to keep in mind, however. One is that members of Soka Gakkai continue to treat electioneering on behalf of Komeito candidates and now also on behalf of their LDP cohorts as part of their religious practice. So Soka Gakkai members have a few core things that they carry out. Uh, they will carry out a chanting um, tradition every morning and every evening, where they will chant sections of the Lotus Sutra, followed by the seven sacred syllables of the title of the Lotus, which is Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And the, the rep, repeated uh, in, invocation of Nam Myoho Renge Kyo is focused on the other uh, cardinal part of their practice, which is a, an enshrined uh, calligraphic mandala. It's an object of worship they receive a, as, um, and they will put into the, uh, an altar in their homes, or in some cases carry on a person, and will serve as the focus of this of this chanting practice. A few other things are sort of uh, key uh, religious practices, things like uh, conversion, uh, which uses the Nichiren Buddhist term shakubuku, which can be translated as to break and convert. 
it, it was considered to be a particularly harsh means that uh, was suitable to lands that had slandered the Lotus Sutra, which included Japan, according to Nichiren. And so interpretations of what shakubuku would entail have changed dramatically over time. So when Sokogaka was growing by leaps and bounds uh, from the 1950s up till the early 1970s, shakubuku was pretty much a hard sell tactic to convert people by any means necessary. And since then has, has softened to a large degree. And these days, members are more, most likely to approach non-members uh, in what is called taila or dialogue as a means of sort of um, convincing people of the benefits of, of joining Soka Gakka. The other things that people will do is uh, solicit subscriptions to Soka Gakka's daily newspaper, which is called the Seikyo Shinbun, or basically the Holy Teachings News is how you might be able to translate that. Um, the uh, Seikyo Shinbun, the newspaper, has a massive circulation, 5.5 million, which is, makes it the third largest paper in Japan. Um, and a few other things, like, and, but, but really key among those is, is electioneering. And that continues to be a, a major source of critique of Soka Gakkai by, by non-Gakkai members. Yeah, I, I want to get back to that, uh, but maybe we should um, quickly define, too, what is unique about Nichiren, uh, Nichiren's interpretation of Buddhism. Sure. Well, um, Nichiren was, when he was young, he was not unique. He was one of many uh, founders of his age who was brought up in the Tendai tradition, which was a dominant uh, temple-based Buddhist order. Um, through his training, he, kind of, he came to realize, though, that uh, within Tendai, the, the lotus was seen as, as, as basically the apex of, a, of an ordered series of teachings from the historical Buddha. But according to Nichiren, he was driven by some concerns uh, of his era, which and one of the main concerns he had was, if all of these other teachings are meant to be effective, why then has Japan run into all of these calamities? Why are there natural disasters? Why do the Mongols threaten to invade our country? Why are there pestilences and wars that are ravaging the place? All kinds of things like that. And he concluded that essentially those other teachings were pernicious and false and that people had been lied to and that they had to instead wholly embrace the lotus in order to achieve uh, salvation for the land. And so he, he basically would put himself into this position of constantly uh, uh, transgressing against the authorities of his day. So he created himself as a biographical model that subsequent generations of Nichiren Buddhist followers have sought to follow. He uh, was exiled twice, and once the the government of his of his age uh, sought to decapitate him in a in a through an execution, and they, that that attempt failed through a miraculous intercession, which is still much debated these days. Um, so, but you know, he lived to a comparatively old age; died in 1282 at 60 years old. But his followers have basically in, embodied this kind of Nietzschean-style martyrdom drive, and this attempt to sort of demonstrate themselves as committed to to a mission that is bigger than themselves. During his lifetime, Nietzsche was a pretty marginal figure; he didn't have a lot of followers. But in the centuries that followed, uh, there seems to be like a resonance between what he taught and the types of, of structures that, came up, that became authoritative. And this became particularly notable in the modern era. And so of the so-called new religions in Japan, the largest ones remain Nichiren Buddhism based. So Soka Gakkai, Risho Kosekai, Reiyukai. And there's another group called Kenshokai, which is uh, opposed to Soka Gakkai quite virulently but also relies upon many of the same teachings. Yeah, one of the interesting features of Soka Gakkai, I think, is how uh, conflict does seem to be a motivating factor, or opposition, I should say, yes. to the trends of the day, I guess you could say. Like, as you pointed out, Nichiren was persecuted, and, um, and then when Soka Gakkai was established by the school teachers in, uh, you know, in the 1930s, it was, um, again, opposed by the state. Um, right. And then since then, into uh, through modern times, Sofa Gakkai has been the uh, object of a lot of uh, uh, criticism and, and even people calling it a, a cult. Um, and it's... So, it, is, do you see that 
with the members that you've spoken with, is that a motivating factor, a sense of uh, being, uh, uh, fighting a, a larger power of some kind? The, the way I would think about it is this. Because one of the questions that always comes to mind is, why would someone join a group like this? Yeah. What, what is the motivation to join a group that is largely maligned, that is seen as being marginal, um, that is, off, as you pointed out, is, is, is labeled with the label with as cult, right? Why, why would anyone join this? And so you have to think instead of what and what to whom has Sokogaka appealed and why? And so the way I think about it is, is to, to make sense of Sokogaka is to look at the institutions it has managed to, to construct. And uh, I've just completed a book, which I'm happy to say is going to be coming out from University of Hawaii Press, in which I talk about Sokogaka in terms of the ways it is mimetic of the nation state itself. And so after the Second World War, Japan was devastated. But then in about two, within about two decades, it, it embarked on what has been labeled the economic miracle. And so it grew from basically being completely ravaged by the experience of, of the Pacific War to becoming the, the second largest economy in the world. Um, and as, uh, there, you know, you're, you're probably too young to remember this, but there was a point at which Japan was seen as kind of this uh, rising force that would rival the United States and all kinds of other things like that. And there was a famous book uh, by Ezra Vogel called Japan is Number One, which is a bestseller and things like that. Um, so Japan was labeled as this great, giant success. But of course, within stories like that, there are all kinds of people who don't enjoy that success, who fall through the cracks who, uh, who aren't able to take part in that, uh, that escalator ride up to, to, to economic security and social legitimacy. Um, women, the poor, uh, there's people who are sick. If your education was robbed from you by the experiences of the war, all kinds of other reasons like that. If you'd moved to the city and no longer had a social infrastructure that you could rely upon, Sokogaka was set about establishing means by which people who were otherwise disenfranchised to achieve social belonging in a format that was that received universal approbation. That is to say, the format approved by the nation state itself. So what does it what does it construct for itself? Well, for for one thing, it is a gakkai. That is, it's a study association, and at the root of all success especially that which is approved by the modern nation, is standardized education. And so it basically gave people a, 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 an alternate means by which to realize educational aspirations, to not only for themselves, but to be able to teach other people and to, to master very difficult things, things like details of Nichiren Buddhist uh, doctrine that is written in medieval Japanese, and then a host of other topics like that. It created a very sophisticated bureaucratic structure for itself, which uh, is read, led by presidents and vice presidents and, and covers everything from cradle to grave, from the earliest education up to massive grave sites across the country. It has a, a newspaper, so it has all of the, uh, the formats of, of the spread of information and the control of information. Uh, it organizes its own uh, secular school system that goes from kindergarten up to Soko University in Western Tokyo. And since 2001, Soko University of America in Orange County, in outside uh, uh, Los Angeles. Um, so in all of these, and of course, Komento, so it has a governmental presence as well. So in all of these ways, members are able to participate in the formats that, that, that give their life meaning, upward mobility, and of course, on top of all of that, you're part of a mission that is greater than all of that because it's a transcendent Buddhist mission of salvation. Yeah. This incredible combination of elements. It was a perfect storm headed by charismatic authority. So at present, Sokogaka is headed by honorary president Ikeda Daisaku, who became third president of Sokogaka in 1960 and since then has been the absolutely unquestioned authority on all matters within the organization. And so... So the group, as it expanded tremendously in these, uh, through these various institutional innovations, also solidified its focal point as Ikeda himself. Yeah, and uh, I think perhaps that is one of the reasons why it's been criticized as cult-like, because it does have this strong emphasis on uh, charismatic leaders, I guess. It certainly does. Uh, and it, yeah, and that, that is a source of a great deal of contention. 
And the members I speak with, though, will often sort of narrate their own lives uh, in terms of their affective connection with Ikeda. So in some cases, they have met him, although in most of those cases, it's, the meetings have been fleeting. But in any event, they, they cultivate themselves, and this, this is a quite explicit in the language they'll use, is as disciples, Ikeda, as Ikeda disciples. And so um, much of what they, they do, they do in the understanding that, at least on an affective level, that is to say, not necessarily on a cognitive, logical level, but on a way that an emotive response that what they do is appreciated by and desired by Ikeda Daisaku himself. And so, for example, the um, urge to really push the boundaries of what you're capable of in terms of working full time, taking part in electoral campaigns for, for Kometo, uh, converting others to Soka Gakkai, training existing members in doctrine, all these things at once, uh, it's extraordinarily demanding schedules that, that, uh, that dedicated members maintain. Much of this is motivated by the to, to uh, that this is what Ikeda Daisaku Sensei wants. So of course this this leads to all kinds of issues that people are, are contending with right now because on January second, twenty eighteen, he will turn ninety years old. He hasn't appeared in public for for many years. Um, uh, although there are the, the administrators of the group are, are are always strongly urging that he's in very good health and is simply, simply uh, you know uh, retired from that kind of activity. But the question does remain, what, what will happen after his lifetime to an organization that has been dedicated to him for, for many decades at this point? Right. And there's no clear successor. Is that correct? Explicitly, no. Uh, this is a group that has forsworn charismatic leadership. And um, so it, it's in the process of undergoing uh, what Max Weber has called routinization. So the, trans, the transformation of, of a charismatic authority that you know, in, a single person imbued with this, with this power into a bureaucracy. And so there's been an attempt to basically uh, get members used to the idea of following along with leadership that has been diffused into this, these different uh, administrative roles. Um, lots of questions remain about what's going to happen, though, as a result of that. Yeah, whether or not that will be successful, we'll yeah. see. Um, um, so how do people get, how do they uh, become part of Sokagaka? What's, what's the process? Does someone just, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of different entry points as there are with the uh, Sure. Mostly uh, the, the members that I've that I've known who converted, uh, I, I should say also at this point that most members are at second or third or even fourth generation, something like 65 percent plus. Uh, easily. So your parents would be members of Sofa Gaka yeah. as you. And that's become increasingly common. And I think actually, ultimately, Sofa Gaka will become a family based religion, as, as, as is the case with many, many so-called new religions that has been that began began as very dynamic uh, conversion oriented groups that have become much more sort of family oriented. Um, but people do convert. And what you're supposed to do is chant actually for three months minimum before you are uh, given a, an object of worship in a formal ceremony and thereafter uh, enter the roles of, of the group. Um, so, and it's quite demanding, actually. To learn the chant is not easy at all. Uh, it usually takes people at least six months or so to quite become adept at that very difficult uh, incantation of um, a Chinese version, or sorry, a, a medieval Japanese version of, of Chinese syllables that re, that uh, read out the teachings of the historical Buddha from India. It's quite, it's, which is sounds quite esoteric, but is performed by millions of people every day. Yeah, and are there so are there set, like Soku Gakkai centers that uh, host? Um, conversion events or, or events intended to bring in new members or do people uh, more engage in, as you most said? Likely, yeah, most likely you will be introduced to, to the organization and, through, and, and to regular practice by home-based group, home-based meetings. Um, and be, people don't meet in temples. Uh, Soka Gakkai uh, began as a lay organization under a temple-based group called Nichiren Shoshu, which was a minority lineage following Nichiren. But in 1991, uh, Nichiren Shoshu and Soka Gakkai split after a series of very acrimonious fights between the leaders, between Ikeda Daisaku on the Soka Gakkai on the one hand and the Nichiren Shoshu priesthood on the other. And so uh, on November 28, 1991, uh, Nichiren Shoshu in one day excommunicated more than 95% of its parishioners. I, I don't know what 
if there's a precedent for that. That's just an extraordinary <laughs> moment for any religion is to get rid of that many people who follow you. <laughs> What's the uh, state of it today? Does it have... Uh... Much reduced, as you may imagine. Yeah. Uh, uh, as yeah, I mean th- that's been one of the, the big issues that people have been contending with. Is like, how do you deal? I mean, on purely on a financial level, for example, with the loss of that kind of uh, parishioner support, uh, it's been a, a massive, uh, a massive blow. And so Kagakai reeled to a certain extent as well, because it had no, from that point, no longer access to its primary object of worship, which is at the head temple of Nichiren Shoshu. So it had to come up with ways around that. It had to come up with ways of producing its own. Um, uh, replicas of that object of worship. And another big thing, and this is a big thing for any religion, is dealing with death, dealing with uh, graves and memorials. And so historically, um, members would be buried at Nichiren, at Nichiren Shoshu temples. And so they, there, was a, there are a lot of lawsuits, many of which are still ongoing, about moving those graves to Gakka memorial sites. And also, there were no longer priests who could perform memorial rites for them. And so all kinds of uh, really intriguing um, institutional, liturgical, and doctrinal uh, innovations had to had to happen in order to accommodate these various needs. Mm-hmm. So I guess maybe it'd be a good time to turn to the current state of Soka Gakkai's political activities. Um, as you noted, electioneering is uh, almost seen. Well, I guess is it seen as sort of like a religious obligation if you're a member of Soka Gakkai? It's certainly treated as such. And um, so ordinary, I, I should return to a point that I lost earlier. So members, if you're going to join Sohogaka and if you're going to get to know about it, chances are you get to know about it through home-based meetings. And the home-based meetings are called Zarankai, which is actually a term for a study roundtable that's ordinarily used by academics. So it would be like it would be kind of like this. If we had a few more people, we'd be holding a Zarankai. <laughs> so it's intriguing that uh, a religion uses this term as their primary uh, uh, meeting. And so they don't, they don't. They no longer meet in temples. They will meet in what are called culture centers. And Sokogakai maintains several thousand culture centers across Japan and also in many other countries. Um, around major elections, you will also start to see people meeting in these zarankai and, and, and other facilities as well to talk about strategies for electioneering. Uh, they will, at times, uh, candidates from Komeito will come and give an address. And they will encourage members to appear uh, where candidates are speaking on the street. So Japanese elections, for one thing, Japan has enormous numbers of elections, um, quite different from the American system. And it runs, they'll run from anything from a, a, a local city council up to what's called the National Diet. Japan maintains a bicameral legislature with the lower and upper houses, all of which are elected. Um, and so you'll see candidates go out, usually it's two weeks before election day. There's, there's a very set period in which uh, candidates are allowed to election year. And they'll go out on the street and give very boring speeches from sound trucks. And ordinarily, if you see this outside of a train station, for example, if you're in Tokyo, you'll, you'll see this during election time. And most people just walk by and there are very few people, if anyone listening. If it's a Komeito candidate, you will often see hundreds of people gathered around. And those will be members of Soka Gakkai. It's extraordinary. That's it's such a contrast. And so they will uh, do this themselves. They'll, they'll get other people who aren't members, for example, to come along. And they'll carry out a pr- practice of going to visit their friends, um, uh, former schoolmates, and anyone that they, any acquaintance they may have had in their lives. They will contact via phone, fax, email, and go door-to-door. Door-to-door campaigning is actually illegal in Japan. It's, uh, it's against the law. But the way around that is if you're going to visit your friend and you happen to speak about the upcoming election, you know, this is not uh, covered by that law. So Gakka members have become quite adept at drawing up lists of their friends uh, whom they'll go visit and then having their fr- their other co-members go with them to help them out on this. It's an arduous uh, campaign, an arduous uh, practice. It takes a lot of energy and, and money to on the part of, of members to carry out. Um, and so, is it part? Is it technically part of their religious practice? No, but it has become woven into the regular uh, Gakkai life expectancy. And so, and there's a bit of a gender split this way as well. You'll see particularly that where the married women's division of Soka Gakkai, which is women who are married or women over the age of forty, uh, in other words, tends to be people who have time during the day 
Japan remains a very uh, gender segregated society on the whole. Um, uh, and pretty and Sokogaka is conservative by Japanese standards. So uh, women will tend to be homemakers uh, or work in ways that they allows allows them to do things like meet in the, on a weekday afternoon, to attend a, a lecture by a local candidate or go door to door. So they actually are working very hard indeed, but usually not drawing a salary. Yeah, well, it seems like this would be a very attractive thing to politicians to have an, an organization like this behind you. Uh, there's no other group matches Sokogakai's ground game. No other group. And so this is a major reason why the Liberal, De Liberal Democratic Party went into coalition with Komeito. Uh, because basically they wanted to take advantage of Komeito's uh, vote-gathering machine. And the, the LDP, the Liberal Democratic Party, that's the dominant party in Japan. That's uh, right. And it's contrary to how U.S. ears might hear it. I think it tends to be the more conservative party, right? It certainly is. Um, they have been in power, except for a few years here and there in the 90s, and then from 2009 to 2012, they have been the governing party since 1955 in Japan. And so for this reason, Japan is often accused of not being a real democracy or being some sort of a compromised democracy. That's actually not true. Um, the, vote, the voters are free to vote whomever, whomever they want. There's a pretty, pretty robust uh, series of mechanisms in place that would allow for the overturning of this power, and that's, there's precedent for it now. The truth is though, that they're just very, very good at staying in power uh, through, through a number of means. And it turns out one of those is taking advantage of Sokogaka's tremendous uh, mobilization potential. But I think there's been maybe some recent cracks in the... Uh the tie so there's, between... Yes, there have been. So there's a really intriguing aspect to this. So the Liberal Democratic Party has been pushing, as you mentioned, they're very conservative. And of late, they've been pushing to uh, toward a campaign of constitutional reform. The most famous aspect of Japan's post-war constitution is what's so-called Article 9. Article 9 forswears the use of belligerence to resolve international disputes and the maintenance of war materials and it's, it's sometimes called the, the uh, labeled the peace clause of Japan's constitution. It's very popular um, and has made Japan quite distinct. Uh, some critics argue that, that, you know, Japan, because Japan did not have to pay for its national defense, it was able to, uh, you know, mobilize instead economically. And that's one reason why it became such an economic powerhouse in the post-war. Um, it is also still used as basically uh, America's largest aircraft carrier. Uh, with uh, bases all over the country. And so there have been all kinds of ways in which Article 9 has been compromised already in terms of its reinterpretation. Japan doesn't technically have an armed forces, but it has what's called the self-defense forces. They actually, has, well, I was going to say they actually, I think, sent some troops to Iraq. Is that right? Right. And so uh, the, there have been a sort of a series of compromises that have allowed SDF forces first to engage in uh, peacekeeping operations in the 90s in Cambodia and a few other places in Southeast Asia. And then into the uh, there was a big sort of debacle when Japan was seen as not pulling its weight during the Iraq war in the 90s. And then thereafter, yeah, has sent troops uh, to, to take part. And so the, the fear on the part of critics is that should the uh, constitution be uh, 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 um, changed, uh, that that um, Japan would enter with, would become a normal country in the sense of taking part in warfare, and this would see uh, combat troops taking part in 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 war in places like Afghanistan or others, and so there are, there's a lot of animosity toward that because the the, the memory of the war remains in Japan, mm -hmm. the memory of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki of wartime devastation, or though, though that, that generation is now dying out, um, it is a keenly important part of Japan's immediate past for many people, and they have no interest in repeating it. Komeito was founded on a platform of world peace. It's actually in the founding charter of the party in 1964. And so... It is uh, what was striking is that in 2015, there were a series of new laws that were put forward, that were rammed through the diet uh, by, by the, the um, LDP and by Comento. Eleven new laws that were called the, um, the security legislation, basically allowing a reinterpretation of uh, the, the Constitution to allow for what's called 
collective self-defense. So in other words, if a, um, a, a and they always mean China, if, if, a, if a power is to uh, attack a, a Japanese ally, in other words, the United States, at, at present, uh, Japan would not be allowed to intervene because of their constitution. Collective self-defense would allow Japan, the Japanese military, to do something, for example, to stop a Chinese ship from ramming an American ship, uh, to shoot down a missile shot from North Korea on its way over to California, things like that. So these are seen as actually by many, by a majority of people as being reasonable. Um, but there are also some hard hardliners who thought that any compromise would be a slippery slope toward uh, the uh, basically returning Japan to taking part in war. And so there were a bunch of big demonstrations outside of the national diet in September of 2015 or before that in the summer of 2015. And what was striking to many people who were observing these, these demonstrations were there were members of Soka Gakkai waving the Soka Gakkai flag. Soka Gakkai maintains a very distinctive tricolored flag, which looks like a national flag. Um, and they were basically rebuking Komeito diet members for violating the founding principles of of their party, but also of their religion, of being because they are fellow Gakkai members. This was striking to many people, and so there has been. That's one. So the latest, the latest stuff. Okay, so right now there has been a, there's a strong attempt on the part of uh, the national government to to. Uh, to revise the constitution. By the way, the Japanese constitution is the longest unrevised constitution ever in history. So that's that's quite a quite a striking thing. Basically, to add a clause or Article Nine to a, to acknowledge that the self defense forces are not on the constitution. So that's that's one thing. So Komeito's probably we'll see how they go. They they may or may not. There has been a rift though. So what's starting to happen also, and I don't know how much this is relevant to those who study religion, but it's certainly relevant to those who study politics. That the national government, Komeito, is cooperating with the LDP. At the Tokyo prefectural level, that is to say basically the equivalent of what we would call the state level in the United States. In Tokyo, Tokyo is massive, right? It's uh, one in four people in Japan lives in Tokyo. If, to if Tokyo were a country, it would have the sixth largest economy in the world. It's wow. just, yes, it's, giant, it's absolutely giant, right? Um, they have a new governor. A woman named uh, Koike Eiko, who is uh, very powerful, very popular, and very right wing, um, and she and very nationalist, but she has secured the cooperation of the prefectural level Komeito in her fight against the LDP. So you got this. So Komeito is cooperating with the LDP at the national level, and they're fighting against the LDP at the Tokyo level. And so you have to think, for one thing, well, that's the, the first big fissure in that uh, alliance. The other is that what kind of voter are you going to have, right? What sort of person has the sophistication to distinguish between supporting this party, the, their, their you know, uh, partner party at the national level, and then fighting against them in different campaigns in the Tokyo level? You have to have a very sophisticated voter, someone who's able to make very fine distinctions, who, who can justify these, this, this seeming paradox, and they do. So Soko Gakkai members are extraordinarily well informed about policy and about um, different aspects of government. They are well informed partly because they're constantly being educated by, um, by either by, by politicians or by fellow members. During electoral campaigns, for example, uh, I was saw a bit of this when I was in uh, Japan last summer in July, right around the time of the upper house election. Diet members were going from district to district and carrying out study sessions, which were attended largely by women, by Mary Women's Division members, who were given extraordinarily detailed um, pieces of paper outlining why each of the 11 laws that had gone through the diet the previous year was not in violation of the Constitution, and how it could be defended when people were at, they were anticipating uh, questions they were going to get when they started to talk to people to solicit votes. I have not seen anything quite like that anywhere else. And so basically the average Gakkai member is better informed about politics and religion than even sitting politicians in some cases or religious professionals in some cases. It's quite an extraordinary thing to see in, in action. So is your sense that most of 
or what has been the reaction at the individual level to uh, Kumeto's support of these changes to the Constitution, and what has been the reaction at sort of the Soko Gakkai organizational level? So at an organizational level, has been remarkably um, distant from it. And in fact, they sort of have issued statements along the lines of, um, we, we resent the sort of attempts to politicize our activities, mm -hmm. which is seen as a bit disingenuous, actually, by some people. The, actu the members are, are complex. The, the, and I have to straight, straight very strongly, these are friends. Um, if you spend, and I, as the way I have it, spend years and years with people, you have to love them. Right? And so these are, these are, I'm not a member of Soka Gakkai, but these are definitely my friends. And as is the case very often with friends, you don't always uh, agree on everything. You know? And so, but I've asked, I've been able to ask people about their reaction. So I actually wrote an article about this, which uh, is available online if you want to look up. Uh, I'll link to that. I'll link to that. That's great, yeah, um, because it includes some of the uh, the responses I received from some of these members regarding uh, what they thought of Komeito's move to support this new law, these new uh, basically pro military laws, and they justified them in most ways. And, and in no cases did I find anyone who said I don't support Komeito anymore. In fact, it was quite the opposite. People were finding ways to continue to support the party, even as they may have had. Issues with specific politicians or, um, you know, sort of prevaricating on various things, they, non they nonetheless uh, continued in their support. And I was anticipating uh, finding all kinds of groundswell movements against it, and I simply haven't found it. And the members who put themselves out there during the, the protests and, you know, advertised themselves as members who were opposed to the new, the new laws have undergone pretty severe ostracization. They've, they've been subjected to all kinds of accusations from their fellow members as either being not really members of Soka Gakkai or deluded or possibly even plants from, for example, the Japan Communist Party or some other opposing force, um, which I don't think is true. Uh, I think they are members who have different opinions, but they've really uh, been stigmatized as a result of speaking out. And so there, there are a lot, there, you know, there are a lot of costs to, to to sticking out in this way. Apparently, yeah. And uh, well, just final couple of questions here. Uh, one just topical with you know, tensions rising around North Korea. What has is your sense that there's more people in favor of these kinds of changes, or um, you know, how is that uh, affecting people's views of debate profoundly i mean in, in most of my conversations i've had with people yeah the the very real geopolitical threats have been front and center um pe members have said you know we are worried about what's going to happen to japan we need we need to be able to to live our lives and so the threats that are the burgeoning threat of north korea for sure but also you know more on the sort of longer phrase of where where is japan going to go what kind of country is this going to be um Komeito is very difficult to pigeonhole as a party. It tends to, re to respond to the priorities of its constituents. And it's, as I mentioned, the constituents are largely are women. And so on the, you don't see a lot of uh, focus most of the time, actually, on, uh, on those kinds of big, big ticket defense issues. You're much more likely to hear things about, um, for example, a, uh, a an uh, allowance to uh, for for new mothers to help raise their children, um, which was a, a commercial policy that became government policy actually in under the LDP. Uh, all kinds of other things about uh, the environment, uh, protecting clean water and air for you know these are the kinds of things that in other words local constituencies are going to worry about. Um, they're willing to go along with the security stuff, uh, although they also uh, portray themselves as the what's called in Japanese the hadome. The break against the 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 most sort of uh, reactionary desires of the, the ruling party, the LDP. So the, the the right wing of the LDP, which is pretty pretty darn reactionary, um, wants to really basically wipe out the constitution, bring bring about uh, a, a, an imagined vision of Japan in the 1930s of a, of, a, of a resurgent imperial order. And they, the Kohometo people and the Sokogakai supporters present themselves as fighting against the worst offenses in that regard. Um, so they see themselves as having a role in government, and they're willing to compromise a lot 
on policy in order to stay in that position, in order to have some to wield some influence, because they spent decades in opposition and they resented being uh, out of out of the game in that regard. Yeah, and so so now that they have uh, a certain level of influence in politics, they're willing to be more flexible with some of these issues that otherwise would be real breaking points for them. That's right. And so in that respect, they are a real party. They're a normal party in the sense that this is how politics works, right? You join you the game. To, you have to compromise in order to, to stay stay relevant. And yeah. they have been doing that. Well, this has been very interesting. Um, thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. I've enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. All right. Take care.